Good afternoon. Oh, it is working. <laughs> Welcome to the, uh, what is today? Friday? Friday afternoon. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, lightning talks. Uh, quick announcement before I get started. Um, we do have additional tickets to the Woosox game tonight. It's a lovely day. Um, and so if you are not already signed up but would like to go, Jason Homer will be here in a Woosox t-shirt. Oh, there <laughs> in the back. See Jason. Uh, so talk to Jason if you would like to go. Um, and it's going to be pretty and apparently fireworks. <laughs> so, all right. And I'm going to set a timer. So I am here to talk today, uh, just give the plug, our annual plug for the documentation interest group, um, where we dig documentation and each other. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so one of the things that's really important in any group, but especially in open source communities, uh, is documentation and making sure that our documentation is up to date and correct because as uh, Margo Morrison um, has a sad face and Bertrand Meyer will tell you that incorrect documentation is often worse than none at all. <laughs> um, so what is DIG? And here's George Bunce Nyman sleeping on a keyboard. Uh, <laughs> so uh, DIG is the documentation interest group. So we are community members who are um, interested in or contributing to um, just the, the community documentation that you can find. Um, the wiki I have up there and all of these slides will be available uh, afterwards. Um, but our wiki has all the information. We have monthly meetings. These are on the first Thursdays of every month, usually, um, at 2 p.m. Eastern time or 11 Pacific and everything in between. Um, we also meet in person and at the Hack Fest. So at the um, Wednesday of this conference, we had a bunch of folks who were there working on and talking about documentation. Um, and we've also had more and more documentation folks attending the Hackaway, um, which happens in the fall. And as far as I know, we don't have a 2023 spot yet. We do, Indiana. Okay, 2023 Hackaway, Indiana. <laughs> um, and then we also have a documentation discussion list, um, which is here and it's also on the wiki. So you could sign up to get, um, uh, any emails about documentation. Um, so Lady Morrison here is very excited about the state of current documentation. Um, in the last year, we had 111 commits and I apologize that I did not get the info on how many and how many new people we had committing, but um, it was a lot, 111 is good. Uh, mostly we worked on 3.9 and 3.10 documentation, excuse me. Um, we have some awesome docs core committers. So Andrea and Blake and Gina who help push uh, our documentation into the code. Um, and we have also had more and more documentation videos submitted to the community YouTube channel. So if you need some visual uh, cues or training on um, how to do some of the things in the software, you can find those on our YouTube channel as well as past com, um, videos and things from conferences. Uh, we have our monthly meetings, like uh, I mentioned before, on the first Thursday. Those meetings um, are intended to be collaboration, discussion, decisions, and demonstrations. I didn't have a D word for that first one, but um, so we, and, and we have a lot of fun. Uh, and we also have a standing agenda item called pet show and tell. So that should bring you to dig just because of that. <laughs> um, we have had over the past year uh, a docs reorganization project and that has been continuing. We have this amazing elaborate spreadsheet that Gina made and um, that has all of the different things. Um, and we can contribute even just from the point of like, hey, look at this thing and it's missing stuff. Check a box. <laughs> um, and that we need people to do that. Uh, you don't have to like have a lot of time to write stuff even just to say, yeah, this or, hey, this needs a different picture because this picture is from, you know, Evergreen version 2.1 and um, it's no longer accurate. So lots and lots of opportunities to participate in that continuing project. It's a huge project. And we also have library settings documentation project. Thank you, Susan. Um, <laughs> where uh, we, uh, she especially is, but others are helping to define all of the library settings and all of the permissions and what they mean and what they do and what the defaults are. Um, instead of just like, here's the name of it and the description of it is the name of it. So, 
um, but there is still a lot to do uh, related to documentation. And Francis Pringle is very um, tasking you with what to do. <laughs> um, so look over uh, your area's workflow. So if you're a cataloger, look over the cataloging documentation, see what's missing, see what needs to be changed, see, um, yeah, if it's something needs to be reorganized or put into a different section. Um, so that's helpful just to, to look over that. Um, if you are someone who has the time or the capacity to uh, keep the docs current, like helping with new releases. Um, and we've, uh, Andrea and others can show you the process for helping with release notes. Um, and you can edit the current documentation. You can report problems. So if you just see one of those and you don't have time to deal with it, put it on Launchpad or send the dig li uh, email list an email um, just saying, hey, this is missing. And we'll add it to our list of things that need documenting. Fill in features, submit videos, um, and then this uh, screenshot here at the bottom is on all of the documentation pages, our official community documentation, where you can just click on that, contact the DIG mailing list. Um, so I've kind of already talked about how you can help, and Tara Bunsnyman is here to help you shred. Um, but <laughs> you can submit to the discussion list any format. We will convert it for, you know, low bar of entry, what, however you can create it send it to us and we'll um, put it into the format we need for it to be online. Um, or if you are familiar with GitHub, you can submit your documentation that way. Um, and we've had s several conferences, pre-conferences in the past um, that will help you. You can watch and see how that happens or come to meetings and we'll tell you. Um, and uh, you can also go to the docs reorganization list spreadsheet and assign yourself a task. So. Thank you all. Um, thank you for everyone who already contributes, who does release notes, who does documentation, um, who identifies and tests those things. Uh, we really dig you. So thank you. And my cats, Naya and Zoe say thank you. <laughs>
All right. <laughs> Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you. All right. We got slides, uh, four of them. All right. So um, I'm here to um, try to get uh, partners for a potential evergreen inventory project. For those of you who don't know me, I am Andrea Bunn Steinman. I am head of, um, I'm head of, I'm the project manager, <laughs> the long suffering, right? No, I'm the project manager for software development at Equinox. Um, I've worked with a lot of you uh, in the community on various uh, cool development projects over my time there. And a couple of years ago, um, we started uh, doing community asks where we would come up with an idea and a proposal and put that out there for the community to see who is interested in working with us on that. And we use this to do um, Simple Reporter, which was a partnership with uh, Missouri Evergreen and um, CW Mars. Um, and now we would like to uh, ask for uh, a real, very real inventory module as opposed to what we have. So currently inventory um, is done as a check and modifier where you know, we'll record your inventory date and this is reportable and like that's fine. But um, over the years, there's been many um, attempts, many proposals, some by us, some by others, um, at actually making a real inventory interface, a dedicated uh, staff interface with configuration options, with different modes where you could be in the stacks, um, you know, scanning live or whether you could scan a file and upload it later. Um, we want to we want to make that happen. Um, we have done a little proposal for that, which uh, in full um, Equinox development team solidarity, I finished uploading to this URL about, you know, 90 seconds ago. So, but it is there now. And if you click on that URL, you can see our inventory proposal. Um, we are seeking one or several partners. We have a flat rate for specifications um, and in interface design at the hands of the uh, brilliant Stephanie Leary. And um, we do really are seeking people who can give us input on specifications um, and have experience with inventory. And if you have tools like you know, dedicated scanners that you use to do inventory, we're definitely interested in hearing what your needs are for that and how this could be a really useful feature for Evergreen. So click there to see some of our ideas. None of what is on that proposal is written um, in stone. Uh, like I said, we were really interested in hearing uh, what people's you know, needs are for this, but we'd love to talk to you. And if you're interested, please reach out to me by May 31st. That's me. I'd love to hear from you and let's uh, make inventory happen. So thank you. Dear Srogan, it, it sounds like a threat, doesn't it? Uh, I don't have slides. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am on the outreach committee, and I have a probably unhealthy interest in the history of things, including the history of Evergreen. I've been around for a good while with the project, but not since the beginning. And one thing that I always loved was a pet project of Kathy Lussier's to do a Git repo with a timeline of important evergreen history events. And I always thought a cool compliment to that would be a chapter book with different chapters written by people who were involved in the history of evergreen. And I was discussing this idea on Twitter with, I th think it was Ruth um, and a colleague of mine, Laura Berry, and then she put an idea into my head, which has not gotten out of it despite my attempts to do so, um, which is what about an oral history of Evergreen? What about a series of interviews that could be accessed say by a podcast method? And I love this idea. So this is an idea that's gonna happen. Uh, and at least one iteration, probably 10 or 12, episodes. And I have a few people in mind that I'm going to reach out to. But I also want to throw it out to people in the room. If you're like, you know, this is something that happened in the history, maybe at my institution and other people don't know about, I would love to hear about it and have a chance to intervene. So I didn't bring a slide with my contact info, but it's rogan.hamby at equinoxoli.org or just Rogan Hamby on Twitter. I don't have a cool alternative name. Um, and feel free to contact me. That's all.
I am not Rogan. I don't know about you. And I am. I am not wearing my glasses. I know they're on top of my head. Uh, and I, dear God in heaven. But I'm trying to like find my cursor as we do here. And then slide these over there. Maybe. Oh, I need to change my display settings. This is the same thing over and over again. Sorry, dude back there. whose name I haven't learned yet. I'm so sorry. No, I got two. Do you remember what we needed to do last time? If not, I'm just gonna, oh wait. Did I lose? I think it's actually there because it's not on my screen now. I'm in technology. <laughs> it's over there. So I'm going to talk about AI taking the load off of people having to think about technology, sort of. It's not exactly true, but. There it is. Yep. Cool. Thanks. You're awesome. Also, I apologize for not knowing your name. I'm not even going to make that full screen there. Move on. So thank you, Kathy, for giving me the courage to uh, take risks. I probably fairly obviously do not have a even working knowledge of what I'm gonna be talking about, except for I know that it exists and I know that we can use it and we have to be brave and try. Um, so how many of you have heard of chat GPT? Mm -hmm. As I say, if I, I see like a handful of developers that very like purposely didn't put their hands up and I appreciate that. And it's not really AI anyway, well, it is. Well, let's not get into that part of it. There aren't really monsters unless you make them, which you can. So this is, I guess the first thing I wanna say is it's here and it is all around us and it has been um, working behind the scenes and we know it, but we've been ignoring it. See also Meta, see also TikTok, see also whatever you want. I mean, seriously, we all know it's there. But now it is also out in the open to play around with, to research, uh, whatever, um, and our children and our children's children and all of them, they are going to grow up in a world where it is part of their everyday being. It is a friend and an enemy as much as the humans that they interact with. And if we want to attract new people to this technological thing, we need to have this be part of it. And it is scary. I mentioned it uh, several times, just said chat GPT because that's the label that's really easy right now. And people said, don't talk about that. And no, <laughs> and ew. <laughs> and um, a couple a couple people said, yeah, I wanna hear more. And I was like, don't ask. So it's very easy to just say artificial intelligence, uh, but it is a little bit more complex than that. I'm not going to teach you about this, but I do want you to think about the differences between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, and how they might relate to the thing that happens in this community. The thing, there are many things that happen in this community. There is coding. There's a lot of different types of coding. There is backend database stuff. There is user experience. There is documentation. There are all of these things. And this could play a part in any number of those to a big degree, to a very tiny degree. I don't know, again, this is for something to think about 
hopefully be inspired to continue down some type of well with maybe a ladder to get back out or not. I don't know. I don't know what's down there. Maybe you want to stay. It was also a real good excuse for me to go to the internet and get cool pictures of mechs. So I did. I do want to remind you, this is never going to replace humans. And if it does, we won't be around and it won't matter. I wasn't going to say that, but then I did. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what it can do is it can take the awesome thing that we have. Each of us has an awesome thing. It is individual to each of us, even if we may have similar skill sets, and it can augment that. And we can leverage it to scale the awesomeness into something bigger, better, hopefully. Now, we all know that when you scale big, you scale both good and bad. And so there has to be a responsibility in that. Of course there does. And that's humans making judgment calls unless you get into deep learning and then maybe it is actually the machine making the judgment call, I don't know. But I did put on here, hopefully, and I used the word healthy and then I kind of went down this little thought thing that was like, what does it mean to teach a machine something in a healthy manner? I don't know, but I really want us to consider that because we have, no, I'm not gonna go down that philosophical well either. Nonetheless, it needs to be safe and that's safe for data, that's safe for humans, all sorts of things. And it needs to be healthy for the humans, not the machine, but maybe the machine too, I don't know. I just caught that was a cool drawing. You find it on DeviantArt and a different kind of augmentation. Anyway, I already said this. Our Zoomers are playing right now with this stuff. They're doing a little bit out in the wild, which is awesome. I'm Gen X and we have a little bit of a chaotic bent and I love every bit of it. I'm not sure that it's burning it down. It's burning some things down and building some things up and they are excited and we need excitement. And I want them to love Evergreen because I love it. That was very evangelical right there. <laughs> oh, also, yeah, our fear, a bucket. And I do think a record bucket is appropriate for, but you could talk about it. It could be copy bucket, I don't know. Item bucket. So some things to think about. Chat GPT is a thing, but there are other things that may be more appropriate to this. I did a very quick thing when I did not eat lunch uh, and was looking for things specifically used for using AI for coding. And this Apache MXNet, I did not do great research, but it mentioned some things that we use. So maybe check it out. Uh, there is also an uh, open API codex that is being used with chat GPT and other uh, language learning models to um, code there. This is just what else can we think about for this? That's the cool logo for the codex. I just thought it was pretty. I was going to show you a little live demo, but I can't because my network in the state of Indiana blocked me. So maybe you can't test this in every network, um, but some of them, and that's, that's all I, I have to say today. Go forth and talk to a machine. It's not a human though, yet. I know, isn't it amazing? I almost forgot it. Who's next? I'll, Stephanie, come on up here. You're the next contestant on Lightning Talks. All right. After we finish this, I'm going to show Ruth a student project that I did last year on text mining to find intertextual relationships in fiction. So, uh, I'm not going to mess with power. We're only here for a minute. All right. Wrong window. Here we go. Great. 
Great. All right. So, hello. My name is Stephanie Leary. I'm the front end developer at Equinox. I started in September, which means I'm very new to the Evergreen community. And I'm going to talk to you about what it's like to be new, especially as a developer in Evergreen. Um, I, obviously, ooh, our video is not great there. Um, developers are not the only members of our community. We also, of course, have documentation writers and editors, interest group participants, People who want to tag videos should get in touch with me because I'm starting a new video library on evergreen-ils.org. And we're going to bring together all the wonderful videos that exist in lots of different places of conference talks and spotlights and presentations and things like that. So if all you want to do is tag videos, we can make that happen. But let me talk about developers for just a second. This is the hardest open source product project I've ever joined. I've been in open source since the late 90s. This one has been really difficult. And the reason for that is that there's no developer documentation or what there is, is 10 to 15 years out of date. There's no inline code documentation that one would expect for things like, what does this component do? There's no function reference. There's nothing like that. I think that a lot of that may have existed in the Angular JS and Dojo interfaces, but it didn't get copied over. So the assumption there is that you've been around long enough to know where these things were defined, and I don't. I'm new. I don't know where anything is. Please help. <laughs> so. The new devs group has been working on putting together some documentation that we found useful as new developers, and it's in the new devs section of the wiki. Um, we are at the point where we're filling it in. We're going to just really drop it on top of what the, the developer documentation is because what's there is so bad, honestly. So we could use some input from the old devs at this point. Um, and I'm going to put this on the main developer agenda in a meeting or two. Um, but I wanted to plant the seed in your mind now that I'm going to be asking you to help with this. Documentation. We have a, a dig that's doing fabulous documentation projects, and I love everything that you're doing, but I didn't know you were doing it until I came to a meeting. And there were Google Doc links that, that didn't exist on the wiki that I could find. So let's pay attention to our wiki and let's keep track of what each of these groups is doing. And like, let's surface that and make it a little more visible for our people who are onboarding. I know that we have several um, groups that are hiring right now, and that's exciting, which means we're going to have some more new people coming in soon. Let's build some better on-ramps for them. For our interest group participants, this is funny because this week I have, you know, talked about, hey, how do we get access for this person to edit the wiki, and how do we get access to the community calendar for this, and every time it's around Robin of, do you know who has access to that? Do you know who has access to that? And the answer is always Galen. So we need to make it a little clearer, preferably on the wiki, who you contact to get access to the things so that you can do the things. Like I said, video taggers, talk to me. Um, I think that we should use the community website to talk more about what we're doing so that our new people know what's being done. Um, we have a lot of development projects coming up. I know the other groups do as well. Who knew that we're rewriting the Mark editor in about a month? <laughs> Was it because I told you yesterday? <laughs> That's Mike. Oh, Mike knew. Mike knew because he gets to do most of it. Yeah. So we have all these cool ongoing development projects or the ones that are coming up. Um, I have been struggling with the acquisitions projects that we have going at Equinox. We're on like the sixth sprint. Yeah, yeah we renamed them. I know we've renamed them. But I, I told, I said to Andrea, where do I go to find the history of this development work? And she sort of blinked at me. <laughs> like this is difficult to come into this late in the game this is what happens when you're a middle-aged open source project right um 
So yeah, we need some wiki pages on how to get involved at different levels. If you're not a developer, what can you do? Where can you start? Based on what your interest is, what do you need to look at first? And that's it. But you're not done with me yet because I have the next slot too. <laughs> so yesterday uh, we had a kickoff meeting for our new user our user interface interest group, which is funny because we all use the user interface. That's the definition. But for the rest of you, even if you don't want to be involved in that group, I wanted you to know why it exists and what it's going to be doing. And if you're a developer, how it's going to help you. So why do we need an interest group for this? Well, Evergreen's UI could use some coordination. I began doing a little inventory of items um, in Evergreen, and I kind of stopped when I got to five search buttons that were all different. <laughs> is the word first? Is it last? Is there an icon? Is it a filled in button? Is it an outline button? What color is it? It depends where it is and what decision the developer made that day. So we need a better system to coordinate this and systematize it so that decisions don't have to be made on the fly because when they're made on the fly, they're inconsistent. The current design process, this is what I observed in my first couple of months at Evergreen. And, um, you know, oh, we need a checkbox for this and a checkbox appeared. And I was like, wait, where was the governance over the UI to talk about, should it be a checkbox? Is that the right place for it? How does that affect the keyboard workflow? Are there other accessibility considerations that we need to think about before putting a checkbox there? Those questions didn't get asked. A checkbox just kind of appeared. <laughs> so the solution to this in large systems is a design system, which is a fancy term that includes a pattern library, but not just a pattern library, because we sort of kind of have that with Bootstrap but it doesn't really tell us how to put things together in a coherent way that emphasize the things we want emphasized. So that's where the layout templates come in. We need um, some templates to kind of talk about how these go together. We need style guides for our microcopy, which is the labels, the form hints and instructions, the buttons, the column headings, the error messages. And we need some guidelines on how to write those things in a way that will be most, um, advantageous for our translators. We need a visual style guide to talk about our use of color, our typography, our spacing, and the user preferences that we, we might want to um, get the most out of the accessibility options we have there. I have an example here that I will show in just a second. This is, a, this is not from Evergreen. This is from a book called Refactoring UI, but it looks a lot like Evergreen. Um, because it's a pretty bootstrappy looking table. Everything's kind of the same weight and it's hard to tell what is important on this page. And he gives it as an example of what not to do so that he can show you this, which is how you would rearrange things to emphasize what is important on that page. In this case, it's the total balance. In our case, it might be the title and author of the work in the, the short bib summary at the top of the search results, which right now the title is so tiny up there, it's hard to find which one you're looking at. So I have some specific projects that this group is going to be doing, but I wanted to sort of let you know that this exists. And if you are a developer, hopefully you'll, you'll be excited about this and you will have fewer decisions to make on the fly that get in the way of you like doing your functionality. And for the rest of us, this is exciting because we're going to make it look good. <laughs> and that's all I have today. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I work at Pales. Um, we started back last year in February, and we started a bug tracking spreadsheet. I thought it would be really easy and very efficient, and it turned out to not be. So surprise, surprise. So what we want to do basically is track all of our local help desk tickets and then what bugs um, are impacting them. And then that will help us with training and development and what projects we want to work on. So if you already do that, 
come and talk to me and help me figure out why what I'm doing wrong. Um, we use JIRA for our help desk. So if you also use JIRA, that'd be great. But it's just basically a plea for give me your ideas if you have them. And if you don't do it, um, if you want to talk about maybe coming up with a way to do it, that would be great too. So thanks. much better yet. Hey everybody. Is everybody doing okay today? I'm having an awesome conference myself. I thought I'd come up here and quickly plug if it'll come up. Let's see here. I'm going to save the uh, subject of my talk until I actually have something to show you. Yeah. Let's see here. Slides. Slides. I'm worried about my battery. It's going to run out. Let's see here. There we go. Boom. So I just, uh, so I'm, I'm Blake Graham Henderson. I'm at Mobius. We're in Columbia, Missouri. And I just wanted to quickly say something about getting an Evergreen server running on your computer. Evergreen is notoriously hard to install. I'm sure we're, everybody in here has tried it and just said, now we'll just stop. But you too can have an Evergreen server. I'm serious. Any computer Step one, install Docker. There's the link right there. No problem. Install that. Boom. Browse this website right here to take a look at all the different containers that are available. And this is kind of what it looks like. When you get to this website, you click on tags, and you can see all the different versions of Evergreen that are available for you to download and install on your computer. Um, three, the latest there is 3.10 and 3.91, 3.90, 3.80, whatever version you're interested in checking out. Um, they're all available for you to uh, poof onto your computer. Step three, open a PowerShell. This is, yeah, I know it's like maybe not your bag, but really all you gotta do is type that in. You don't need to even know what it does. Uh, the, only, the, only thing, the, the only thing you need to know is the last bit that's in red, what version of Evergreen you're interested in having on your computer for testing. I, in this example, put the version number 391. If you don't put a number at the end, it'll just choose the latest whatever is up there at the latest. And you wait about five minutes and you open a web browser and boom, there's the Evergreen server on your computer, okay? And then one little note here is that the SSL certificates, your web browsers nowadays really, 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 really want you to have that certificate. And uh, of course, you being, you're on your test machine and everything, there's no certificate. Certificates cost money or there's a setup for all that. So there's a fake certificate on there and the browser hates that. And you're going to get a big nasty note about uh, connecting to a thing that might not be secure, blah, blah, blah. It's secure. It's fine. It's your, it's your local machine. No problem. And you'll have to say, okay, click, click, click. Then the browser will give you this red warning up there about not being secure. But you can you can safely ignore that. You're on your local host. Um, the web the URL, if you can't see it, is just literally the word local host. That means my computer. Click through the SSL certificates, that's what I was saying. And now by default, all of these containers that are out there, uh, the login to the staff client is admin demo 123. The end. That does work, good, okay. Uh, give me a second, get the display going. I know the clock is ticking. Mirror. Okay. 
All right. Why didn't that work? So it did it flash on and then it disappeared? Okay, hold on. Sorry, y'all. This always happens. I mean, yeah. Thank you. So there we go. Oops. Okay. Okay, so while while we're dealing with Yeah, I mean I have it. You worked fine before, so you said yeah. asterisk must have changed. Yeah. Um weird. Mirror. Why? You want to try this one? That's the one I use. We'll give it a shot. You got an XPS 13. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This the last game. Wait. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. It's uh, actually uh, Fedora, but um, I mean, it should work. Come on. Oh, interesting. It's not showing the displays anymore. All right, we're going to try one more thing. We'll log out and back in. Let's see if that does something. This is an anti advertisement. It works. The same device you tested earlier? Um, I haven't done it in this room, but I have okay. done a presentation with this. Okay, weird. It's still displays. No, it's still not seeing it. I just broke it. All right. So I'm going to talk about, I'll, I'll figure it out. It'll be all right. Um, I'm going to talk about um, Evergreen and Open Athens. Integration. Now, Open Athens, who's heard of it? Okay, yeah, all right. So, despite the word open being in Open Athens' name, it is not open source. Um, but the uh, it is a product that is developed in the UK, and EBSCO has been sort of brokering to certain sites. And the Board of Regents um, project called Galileo, which is our, our sort of online database program, needed to replace Easy Proxy, which is, you know, not great for anybody. Um, and they they were really, they did a big PR push over, you know, 2018, 2019 to get that uh, going in place. And they um, they implemented this over the pandemic for uh, for our libraries. All right, let me see if this will work this time. No, okay. I'm just gonna officially give up here. Um, so, <clears throat> ow, this hurts. Cause I just, I just spent like the last, I spent the first couple of lightning talks putting together a, a very uh, thrown together slideshow. Um, so anyway, okay, so, the first thing you do, I, I, I will look at the slideshow because I can, right? Um, okay, here we go. Everybody pray. Okay. All right. Well, it's a blank presentation. Okay. Well, that's sad. 
It's not Fedora's fault. Don't blame Fedora. Okay. Um, so, um, God, it's embarrassing, y'all. I'm sorry. Okay. The way this works, so what, what Open Athens is doing for us is it is an identity provider um, for a single sign-on across basically any resource that you can come up with. Now, the fact that um, it integrates with Evergreen, it kind of makes it sound like, huh, well, I guess we'd be using Open Athens all the time from Evergreen and, and doing that, but that is actually not what happens. Evergreen, what, what the integration allows you to do is if you have an Open Athens subscription and you want to use your Evergreen patron database as your single sign-on source, this will allow that to happen. Um, and so uh, the way Open Athens is uh, configured, well, what this does for the end user is you can be on your library's website and you want to go to the Auto Repair Resource Center that your library subscribes to. They click on the button. It takes them to, the, to your catalog login, the, the, the OPAC. And then you log in and then it goes straight to the resource seamlessly. That's, that's what it's meant to do. Um, in Pines, we've always had some sort of Galileo integration, but that meant you had to go to the Pines site, click the Galileo link, and then it would take you to the Galileo page. This takes that step out entirely and it works for all kinds of other databases. Um, you know, uh, so uh, this was developed by Julian Clementson of Open Athens. Uh, as I said, they're based in Great Britain. Um, they have an admin interface on their side. You log into that interface. I'll show you later on, on my own computer if you're interested in seeing the screenshots I took. Um, but you can go in and create an API key that you can then copy into Evergreen. Um, the administration uh, interface for that is a standard, you know, newer Angular interface that was actually developed by the Open Athens team. It's probably the best non-Evergreen community vendor development I've ever seen. They've just, they really came in and, and followed the rules and conventions as they exist. Um, based on the last presentation. Um, and they, but yeah, he did a great job. And so it creates a local administration menu entry for Open Athens integration um, called Open Athens Sign-On. Uh, you can then, you can actually have several different Open Athens identities. It's tied to the org unit and its descendants. Uh, so for us, it's all of Pines, but you know, if a single library subscribed to something like this, you could actually just build it in so that that one library could, could be using it. Um, you create uh, which org unit does it. It has an active on off button. Uh, you put in all the connection information that you get from the Open Athens side, and you can control how much data gets sent to Open Athens as the requests go through. So the very minimum, they just need to know things like the home library and probably the barcode of the person. And that's what we release, but you can release things. Let's see, it's got, um, you can do the prefix of the name, the first name, middle name, surname, suffix, all of that information can go to them. If that's, you know, if you've got a situation where you actually do wanna share that information for reports or something like that on the Open Athens end. Otherwise it just checks, is this person actually a library patron at this particular library? And if so, it does the appropriate thing. So um, because it's tied to Evergreen authentication and it knows what's going on with the accounts, it does respect account blocks and things like that. So um, any quick questions? Anyway, I got a quote, couple of questions about this uh, since I started the conference and um, thought it would be a good idea just to do this. And, you know, I'll, I'll show you my screenshots. This, yeah, see, okay. Where did mine go? 